Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series about the English Civil War. In part one, The Death of a Duke, we will talk about the many quarrels between King Charles I and a series of parliaments early in his reign. Most of these quarrels centered around Charles' favorite, the arrogant and incompetent George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. A saying among English historians states that King James steered the ship towards the rocks, but his son Charles wrecked it. During the last full year of his reign, 1624, King James gave Parliament something they wanted, a war with Spain. Of course, this war had little to do with a crusade against Europe's greatest Catholic power. Rather, it centered on James' grudge against the Spanish for turning down a marriage offer between his son Charles and the Spanish Infanta, or Princess. James even sent an army to help the Protestant princes of Germany in their war against the Catholic Habsburgs, which cheered public opinion in England. Yet, James never really resolved the underlying problems between himself and Parliament, which grew far worse under his son Charles. A stubborn and shy man, Charles Stuart only stood four feet and seven inches tall. Nonetheless, he gave his future subjects hope. He showed himself to be the opposite of his loud-mouthed, uncouth father. He was mindful of decorum, private to the point of being secretive, and always cool and collected. He gave people hope for a more dignified monarchy, but Charles inherited dangerous beliefs about kingship from his father. Charles believed kings to be little gods on earth, the father of the nation, and like any 17th century father, he held himself responsible for the prosperity of his children, yet he also expected strict obedience, and any of Charles' subjects who showed themselves to be disobedient could expect swift and severe punishment. Charles intended to be a reasonable father king, at least as he understood the word. He would listen to their representatives in Parliament, but only when he called them and only to talk about matters he judged fit for discussion. For a landowning class accustomed to at least believing they had a say in government, this would be a bitter pill to swallow. Indeed, many vomited it up. Bad omens plagued Charles' February 2nd, 1626 coronation, among them being that Charles considered himself too lofty to march in his own procession. On top of that, one of the wings on the dove topping Charles' scepter broke off. A jewel fell out of his coronation ring. Worst of all, the ground near the coronation site trembled from an earthquake. The superstitious began to whisper that Charles' reign would prove an evil time. Yet that need not have been the case. Charles inherited a kingdom rankled and irate over the political mistakes of his father. Yet it remained at peace while the Thirty Years' War raged on the continent between Catholics and Protestants. However, peace in England was gravely threatened by Charles' failure to rid the royal family of its most noxious retainer, George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. Having lost his elder brother early in life, Charles saw Villiers, his father's favorite and probable lover, as a surrogate elder sibling. And this would be the source of the early disasters in Charles' reign. Irate over the failure of the Spanish marriage, Charles wished to punish Spain. In his own quiet way, he also wanted to become a great Christian soldier during the Thirty Years' War and to live up to the heroic example of his elder brother, Prince Henry. A champion of the joust and darling of Protestant reformers, Prince Henry had died of a kidney ailment at the age of 18. After the death of Prince Henry, his armor passed to his younger brother, Prince Charles. And when Charles tried to wear his revered brother's steel, it proved to be much too large. Some say that Charles spent the rest of his unhappy life and reign trying and failing to fit that armor. Yet one man who might wear the armor of the man who should have become King Henry IX was George Villiers, 
at least in Charles' mind. It proved all too easy for Villiers to talk Charles into giving him command of an expedition to Cadiz. When King Charles asked Parliament for money, the fervent Protestants who filled it coughed up. Yet they included a protest about Villiers being given command. While they provided enough money to last a year or less, they held out the prospect of renewal if things went well. Indeed, Parliament fully expected and likely hoped for Villiers to prove a spectacular failure. Why did Parliament hate Villiers so much? They saw him as an obnoxious and arrogant upstart, promoted wrongly over the great men of the realm, such as themselves. The expedition set sail in October 1625, but because of poor organization and bad equipment, the expedition failed to even reach the city. Rumors of sabotage by Villiers made the rounds in both the aristocratic salons and working-class taverns. Parliament introduced a bill to impeach Villiers in May 1626. Yet even the thought of Parliament giving orders to the king appeared to be an end to the monarchy itself, at least in Charles' eyes. To save Villiers and his crown as he understood it, King Charles dissolved Parliament. He then tried Villiers in the Star Chamber, conveniently filled with Charles' flunkies. Needless to say, Villiers walked away a free man. For the moment, Charles did not have to worry about Parliament shouting. Yet, how could a king collect money without Parliament to levy taxes? For a time, King Charles found his answer in forced loans. Much like the absolute monarchs emerging on the continent, Charles put those who dare to defy him on trial. Two of their number, Sir Francis Barrington and Sir Edmund Hampton, died while in prison, awaiting trial. Many others paid up, but they did so simply to stay out of trouble. That also did not stop them from complaining, using a new and fearsome language. The rest of taxpayers did not see a king misusing his power, but a despot who threatened the liberties of England, which also happened to involve their pocketbooks. When Parliament met again, they did not prove shy in speaking against these outrages. Not surprisingly, King Charles dismissed them. This would be the first of three times in four years that he sent Parliament home when they told him things that he didn't want to hear. While King and Parliament fought over George Villiers, England drifted towards war with France. In June 1627, King Charles gave Villiers personal command of a second expedition, 8,000 strong, to relieve the Huguenot stronghold of La Rochelle, which was under a Catholic siege. During the four-month campaign, Villiers did show personal bravery, exposing himself to French fire. Yet his gross ignorance about war led to another humiliating defeat. In 1628, Parliament again tried to force Charles to dismiss his surrogate elder brother. Speaker after speaker took to the rostrum, pounding the podium as they thundered in defense of English liberties. For a brief time, it looked as if Charles would cooperate, at least for a time, to save his beloved George Villiers. Nobles might have placed their hope in negotiations. The common people, who blamed Villiers for all the government's failings, did not. Taverns filled with rude ballads about Villiers. Pamphleteers put up outrageous leaflets about his supposed debauchery and wickedness. On June 28, 1628, a London mob gathered for a We Hate the Duke meeting. During the gathering, someone saw John Lamb, Villiers' doctor and a court magician, leaving a playhouse. Lamb himself had a foul reputation, having forced himself on a woman and gotten off because of his connection to Villiers. However, another widely believed account claimed that Lamb had invited two men to his house. When they doubted his skill as a magician, he was said to have conjured a tree from thin air, then magicked up three dwarves to chop it down. One man, named Barber, claimed that he brought home a splinter of Lamb's tree, 
The doors and windows of his house would not stop opening and slamming shut until Barber threw it out the window, according to the tale. Whether or not there was any truth to Lamb's sorcerer's ways, the people believed them. And when the members of the We Hate the Duke meeting saw Lamb leaving the playhouse, a howling mob poured out of the meeting and pursued Lamb through the streets. Though Lamb fled from tavern to tavern, the mob finally caught him and beat him to death on the streets. A month later, Villiers arrived in London to organize a third expedition to the continent. Earlier, Villiers had refused a naval lieutenant named John Felton, a veteran of his disastrous campaign's command of a ship. Felton fumed over Villiers' rudeness and slight. Upon hearing of Parliament's attempt to impeach him, Felton mistakenly took that as a signal Villiers had become an outlaw. On August 23, 1628, Felton waited for Villiers outside the Greyhound Inn in Portsmouth. After Villiers finished his breakfast, Felton stabbed him through the chest. Though the authorities hung Felton, the sailor became a national hero, with hundreds turning out to his execution so they could shower the sailor with flowers. This should have been an early warning to King Charles I. He did not take it. With the cheering of his subjects at the death of his beloved Villiers still in his ears, King Charles shut down Parliament again. However, the parliamentarians took advantage of a rule that Parliament could not disband as long as the Speaker sat in his chair. So angry MPs held the Speaker in his seat while they passed three resolutions by acclamation. The first said that any man who tampered with English Protestantism would be considered an enemy of the state. Second, anyone who attempted to impose taxes without Parliament's consent would also become an enemy of the state. Third, anyone who paid illegally imposed taxes, surprise, surprise, would be considered an enemy of the state. Having ensured their resounding protest and condemnation found its way into the record, Parliament voted to adjourn. King Charles no doubt breathed a sigh of relief. As always, he was gravely mistaken. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.